In the previous video, I teased what is probably the most sweeping and useful characterization of when a continuous function gets to be uniformly continuous, and that is when it is predicated on a compact domain. So in the motivation for this, I argued that the failure of a continuous function to be uniformly continuous is an example of what I call the local to global heartbreak. Because for a continuous function, once you pick an epsilon, every x in my domain is going to have a different, potentially, delta that goes along with that epsilon to demonstrate that the function is continuous at each of those x's. But if my domain is not compact, those infinitely many different x's may not have a consensus single x that they all sort of can agree upon. But when the domain of my function is a compact set, we'll see that they are forced to have a delta, which is positive, non-zero, that every x in the domain can agree upon that gets all of the images of points that are delta close to be epsilon close to one another. So in this video, I want to take a look at a proof of this assertion, that every continuous function is uniformly continuous on a compact subset of its domain. Let's take a look at the proof, and this is a little bit technical. So this will be a little bit maybe more uh, of a 40,000-foot of a view of the argument. But I do also want to sort of show you what those details look like. So this is going to be a little bit nuts and boltsy compared to a lot of my other videos. But strap in. Let's take a look at how the argument works. So I've outlined over here the main sort of steps in the argument. I just kind of want to talk through those first to get an overview of what the proof is going to be like. So our burden of proof is to show that for an arbitrarily chosen epsilon greater than zero, we can find a delta, and I'm going to be calling that delta capital delta here to distinguish it from a bunch of other little deltas that we meet along the way. We can find a capital delta such that all of the points in my domain that are capital delta close to one another will have images that are epsilon close to one another. And how we're going to do that is by starting from continuity. So starting from continuity, we will be able to say that every point in the domain has a delta ball whose image is within, not only within epsilon of, uh, of one another, but in fact within epsilon over two. So this is going to be, there's going to be a couple instances here where we take what we have and we make it even a little bit uh, tighter. We take the, the estimate that we have and make it smaller by cutting it in half because later on in the proof, we're going to need to piece together a couple of those estimates to get back to where we started. So this is the first such instance of that. So every x is going to have a delta ball whose image is within an epsilon over 2 ball in the codomain. But then the collection of all of those, not delta balls, but again, we're going to cut those balls radius in half to get a bunch of delta over 2 balls. But that collection of all the delta over 2 balls for all the x's in my domain is going to form an open cover of E. The problem is that that open cover is so ridiculously infinite. Right? Every one of the points x in my domain is going to have its own delta over 2 ball. And so there's infinitely many sets in this open cover, probably uncountably infinitely many sets in this open cover. But, and here is the key insight, the compactness of the domain E is going to let us extract from that ridiculously infinitely large open cover a finite subcover that still covers the entirety of the domain. And that finite subcover is going to be made of delta over two balls around a finite set of x's in my domain. And because there's only finitely many of them, we can pick the ball that has the smallest radius and make that smallest radius my capital delta. This is going to be the magic delta that is going to force points that are capital delta close to have images that are epsilon close. And the rest of the argument is just filling in those details. How do we know that if x and x naught are capital delta close, that their images will be epsilon close? So that's the overall sort of overview of what the proof is like. And so that took me, what, two minutes <laughs> to describe just the overview. Um, let's go through the details. So if you're kind of satisfied that this argument generally makes sense, eh, maybe you can skip to the next video. But if you want those gory details, let's get into them. So we'll start the proof by letting epsilon be arbitrarily chosen. So the universe comes in, picks an epsilon for me. But then the next thing that I'm going to do is cut that epsilon in half. And so rather than my argument trying to get within epsilon, I'm going to have my argument at the continuity stage here try to get me within epsilon over 2 of the images of f of x. And so what continuity tells me is that every point x 
that is in my domain is going to have some ball around it, which we're going to call a delta ball, whose image is not only epsilon close, but in fact, epsilon over 2 close. So we're going to use this opportunity to get epsilon over 2 close to the image. And so every point in my domain is going to have potentially a different delta that works for it. Right? Some points are going to have deltas that are uh, fairly permissive. Right? I can have a pretty large delta in some places. And in other places, I need to make my delta pretty small in order to do what I'm trying to do. But for every different point in my domain, we're going to get potentially a different delta ball uh, that we can construct. And I'm going to call those delta balls uh, u sub x, ultimately. But actually, when we do this part of the argument, we're going to get a collection of balls that are going to form an open cover of E. But the balls that I want are actually going to be balls where I cut this radius in half to give myself even a little bit more breathing room than we might otherwise have had. So instead of taking the radius of my balls to be delta, I'm going to cut them in half even further so that even even if I had a lot of breathing room at, at various different points, I'm going to cut each of those balls radius down in half uh, in order to get the actual open cover, uh, the actual sets which are going to form my open cover of the domain. And so the collection is an open cover of E because, first of all, each one of these sets is open because it itself is already an open neighborhood in the metric topology. So each of these UXs is an open set. And they form a cover of E because each point x in E, at least, at minimum, belongs to its own u sub x. So we have uncountably infinitely many of these sets, which taken together form an open cover of the domain of my function, which we're calling E. And then here, of course, is where the most important part of the argument happens. Because we have assumed that E is a compact set, this open cover, even though it could be ridiculously largely infinite, will have a finite subcover. So only finitely many of these u sub x's are necessary to cover the set E. And because that's true, we can pick u sub x1 up through u sub xn, which are a finite subcover of E. So there's only a finite collection of x values in my domain such that the delta over 2 balls around those x values blanket the entire domain. And so then I can take those radii, half of delta x1 up through half of delta xn. I can pick the smallest one of them, because it's only a finite set. We know that the smallest one of them exists. And moreover, because all of their members are greater than 0, and there's finitely many of them, the smallest one will also be greater than 0. And so that's what we're going to define to be this capital delta this smallest possible sort of half radius. So I've kind of sketched it down here, this really teeny tiny little smallest possible half radius that we find among this finite collection of delta over two balls is going to be what we call capital delta. So now to satisfy the, the deities of uniform continuity in the definition, we're going to let x and x naught be arbitrarily chosen but we're going to assume that they are capital delta close to one another. So my x and my x naught could, in principle, be anywhere inside of my domain. But we know, and this is the key fact, that they are closer to each other than any of my xi's. These are the center points of the balls whose finitely many of them cover my entire set. They are, x and x naught are closer to one another than any of the xi is to any of its nearby points whose image is epsilon separated from its own. That is a long and wordy way to say the argument that I'm about to make uh, over the next five minutes, probably. This is the part, this is the most technical part of the argument. But this is why this whole argument works, is that by choosing the smallest radius of any of my finitely many delta balls, we can guarantee that any x and x naught that are that close to one another will be closer to each other then any of the center points of my balls is close to a nearby point whose image is further than epsilon from its own. That is saying in words what let's go ahead and say in symbols and mathematical formalism. So I pick an x and I pick an x naught that are capital delta close to one another. And if you zoom in on this video and squint really closely, what it looks like is I have picked an x which belongs to one of my 
delta balls, one of my finitely many delta balls, delta over two balls. And my x naught might or might not be within one of those delta over two balls. But we're going to argue that it is at least within the delta ball. So this is going to be where that dividing by two actually was really necessary. So since delta was so small, it turns out that what we've guaranteed is that x and x naught are within the same delta ball around some point of E where the delta is given by the definition of continuity. So this is the, this is the key insight, that my x and my x naught are so close to one another that they lie within the same delta ball around a point where that delta was chosen so as to be within epsilon over 2 of the images. So here's what this piece of the argument looks like. We pick an x and we pick an x naught arbitrarily, but we, guarantee, we, we sort of require that they are within capital delta of one another. Since my u sub x's form a cover of E, that means that the x that we've chosen is in some u sub x. It's in one, at least one of these sets in my finite subcover. So there exists a point which I'm going to call x prime, such that x belongs to the u x prime. This is the half of delta x prime ball around x prime. So x belongs to this brown interval right here, which is one of the intervals that's a part of my finite open subcover. And so by construction, that means that x is no further away from x prime than half of x prime's delta radius. But then also, we have assumed that x naught and x are capital delta close to one another. So x naught is no further than capital delta away from x. But capital delta is the smallest of the half radii of the center points of the balls which form our finite open subcover. And so since it's the smallest, that means that x naught is also no further than half of delta of x prime away from x, because half of delta of x prime is going to be one of these half of deltas which belongs to the set of radii in my finite open subcover. <sighs> Even I'm getting out of breath <laughs> from this argument. So x, what we're, what we're supposed to take away from this so far is that the distance between x and x prime is no more than half of x prime's delta radius and also that the distance between x naught and x is no more than half of x prime's delta radius. So how far away is x naught from x prime? So x naught, which might be outside of this half radius, will be able to show that at least it's within the delta radius around x prime. Why? Because of the triangle inequality. The distance between x naught and x prime is no more than the sum of the distances between x naught and x which are bounded by one half of the delta radius at x prime, added to the distance between x and x prime, which is also no more than one half the delta radius at x prime. And so the distance between x naught and x prime is no more than half plus half of the delta radius around x prime. In other words, x naught and x prime are within delta of x prime away from one another. So x and x naught are both within the delta x prime ball centered at x prime. In other words, this sort of orange interval here, this interval from before we cut our radii in half, this interval here is going to contain x for sure because we know x is within the half radius ball around x prime, but it's also going to contain x naught because x naught is no more than capital delta away from x, and that capital delta is less than or equal to that half radius as well. So both x and x naught are within this delta ball around x prime, where that delta was specifically chosen so that that entire delta ball is going to fit within the epsilon over 2 ball around f of x prime once we apply the function to this. So if I kind of slide this over here, that the way that we picked this delta to begin with was so that the images of all of those points are within epsilon over 2 of the image of x prime. So we can now finish the argument. Since x and x naught are both within the delta ball at x prime, that means that their images are epsilon over 2 close to one another. Well, they're epsilon over 2 not close to one another, actually. Let me back that up. What they are is their images are epsilon over 2 close to the image of f of x prime. And so this is why we had to cut the epsilon in half at the beginning of the argument. 
because we don't know up, up front how close the images of x and x naught are to one another. But we know based on this argument that each of them is epsilon over two close to f of x prime. And therefore, how far apart can f of x and f of x naught be? They can only be as far apart, according to the triangle inequality, as the sum of how far f of x is from f of x prime, which is no more than epsilon over two, and how far apart f of x naught is from f of x prime, which is also no more than epsilon over two. And so here we have a bound by epsilon. Whew, man. I don't get out of breath in a proof very often, but there are so many little details to this proof that make it really easy to kind of lose the overall shape of the argument. But the overall shape of the argument, just to recap it, is that continuity gives me a delta at every different point x of my domain. And that is so many deltas that it might be a bottomless pit that goes all the way down to zero if we're not careful, which would be a local to global heartbreak. But when my domain is a compact set, we'll be able to extract from those infinitely many different deltas a finite set of deltas, such that the smallest one of them is still positive. That smallest one is going to give rise to the radius, the closeness that we have to guarantee between two points and x and x naught in order to guarantee that their images are epsilon close to one another. And so all those technical details in the back half of this proof are really just filling in the gaps in that sentence and to show to how we can make good on the promises of that heuristic argument. And so what we take away from this is that any continuous function is uniformly continuous on a compact subset of its domain. And from this, we actually get the final guarantee. So the third guarantee of uniform continuity comes from this observation, comes from this result that we just proved. And that is that if I have a function which is uniformly continuous on some large set, it will also be uniformly continuous on any subset of a set on which it is uniformly continuous. So what we might say is that uniform continuity is a property that gets inherited by subsets from its larger set. So if I have a function which is uniformly continuous on a compact domain, it will also be uniformly continuous on any subset of that compact domain, even if those subsets are no longer compact maybe not even any longer bounded or not even any longer closed, right? Well, I guess it still has to be bounded, but not even any longer closed. And so the final guarantee of uniform continuity is if I have a function which can be continuously extended to a compact domain, then that function will be uniformly continuous. So if we can take my function and extend it in a continuous fashion to a larger domain which is compact, then that function must have been uniformly continuous on the original domain because it will be uniformly continuous on the larger compact domain because every continuous function on a compact domain is uniformly continuous. So just to close, let me show how we can use this third guarantee to prove that a function is uniformly continuous on a domain which itself might not be compact, but which might be able to be enlarged, even if just by a little bit, in a continuous fashion to a compact domain. What might an example like that look like?